Great. Well, thank you everyone for having me virtually. Uh, believe me, I really, really wish I was here in person. My name is Pierre Bédenès. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Neurora. Neurora is a startup in Calgary, Canada, that is really focusing on improving electrode recording so we can provide a better diagnostic to patients. As you know, 1% of the population is suffering from epilepsy. And for a third of them, the medication doesn't work or it stops working, like my friend Nicole that you see here on that picture. And by the way, on that picture, I will not tell you who I am, that's for you to guess. Now, Nicole had a normal life, you know, she was like going to school, going, was going to get the job of, uh, of her life and mid twenties, she started to have more and more seizures. She goes to the hospital, they put intracranial electrode inside her head, she gets connected to that EEG system, thanks to that 30 foot cable, and she stays about two weeks in a hospital bed. They record mm -hmm. activity 24 hours a day and she was seizing every single day. At the end of that recording time, daughters come to my friend, Nicole, and say, Nicole, we don't know what's happening to your brain. We're gonna send you back home with a new medication. She was of course frustrated, but that frustration, I could see it in the eyes of the doctors as well, who simply didn't know what to do with her. And because I was doing my PhD in brain monitoring and I was a bit nerdy, and I'm still nerdy, I asked to look at the data. And I saw something like that. Typically those are EEG traces, as you know, it's kind of an electrical signature of the brain and it's really like an earthquake. You really try to understand where is the epicenter of that earthquake? Where do the seizures start and where they propagate? Now, when you're a neurologist, as you know, it's very hard to do that, especially when the data are extremely noisy, as well as the, the whole brain looks like it's lighting up at the same time. We have many doctors that tell us it's a bit like going into fishing expedition. And that of course is causing multiple problems. When you're a neurologist or a neurosurgeon, where do you know when you need to do ablation resection where should you put the electrodes for neuro simulation when you don't even know where it is started? And when you're a patient, it's already a very hard process, but you have to stay in that bed until the doctors deem that they have enough data that is sufficient for them to actually make a diagnostic. This is exactly what my friend Nicole had to go through. And this is what we saw. At Neura, we have developed electrodes that are captured at a much higher resolution and are much more sensitive than existing electrodes. We consistently track seizures across the brain and we can also capture biomarkers and inter events, which as you know, are events that happen between the seizures and that could also help us understand where seizures start and where they propagate. We then take all these electrical data that we capture thanks to our sensors and we overlay them on top of the three-dimensional model of the patient's brain that we gather thanks to the MI data. Now, the beauty of those sensors is that we actually fit into what's called a class two fact and K application with FDA because they are existing electrode that we can leverage in order for us to get our electrode to market. Now, what is special about it and what is our advantage? We actually can manage to get, uh, to cut through the noise and actually really, really focus on the activity that matters. Between the different electrodes we built, we can actually track activity and finally understand where are those earthquakes starting. We can even detect early onset of seizures before what we will call the full burnout seizures, which means that we could in the long term also predict the seizures. The data you see here, I extracted from a SHIP study that we completed in Australia, thanks to the Bionic Institute, as well as the Fleury Institute in Melbourne. We have shown this data to many clinicians who confirm that this will change the way they do their practice once they can properly track the data inside the patient's brain. Now, actually, some of them decided to invest in us for an investment round that we had when they saw this data. For us, going to market means that we first have into selling those electrodes. We sell for intraoperative monitoring and then down the line for neuro monitoring. Again, the same process my friends Nicole went through. After that, we believe that those electrodes can also improve the implant that we built today. And we plan uh, to license or build our own implant down the line. We are already in discussion with many partners uh, to go that direction because once you can listen the brain better, you can stimulate better. We are very fortunate to have very talented people in our team based in Calgary, but equally fortunate to have many advisors around the world that support our journey uh, on building that platform composed of both the electrode and the software. I won't name all of them. As you know, many of them are the usual suspect, if I may, may say it that way. We are very thankful to be in front of here today because down the line, because our electrodes can go quickly to market thanks to this 5 k application, we believe we can get them to doctors by the beginning of next year. And this is exactly what the price from the Shardine competition will help us. 
Thank you very much. Sure, let me begin. Uh, here, my understanding, do you go through a traditional burr hole for your approach? Correct, yeah. Our, our plan has always been to fit into the existing surgical process for two okay. reasons, mainly because we want to make the process easier for doctors so they don't have to invent or relearn a new technique, but also because from a regulatory perspective, we are different in the sense that it is the sensors we, press, we, we position on this existing depth electrode, for example, that mm -hmm. really makes a difference. And so that from a regulatory perspective, as you can imagine, is also much quicker for us. And are the electrodes, sorry, are the depth electrodes the same size as existing electrodes or are they different size? So we actually managed to do uh, thin and larger size or larger size, I would say the exact same one that we have today. And that was mainly driven by uh, doctor's feedback. Uh, they told us, for example, if you go too thin, typically they tend to break. And as usual, like it, it doesn't, doesn't work, obviously. So we tried to make them about the same size. We could go thinner if we wanted to, but we actually maintained the, the same diameter as today. So if I'm a clinician, you know, what I think one of the, the questions I would have would be, uh, I, I think according to your, your papers that your signal to noise ratio is about three times better. And I think the question in my mind would be, uh, does that in practice translate to better surgical targeting? Uh, does it in practice translate to using fewer electrodes to get to the same target? What is the exact clinical advantage? The signal to noise ratio sounds good, but in practice, what is really going to change about the way assessment, for example, for an ablation procedure uh, and, and the completion of that procedure is actually going to be in, when, your, when your product is used compared to the, the current state of technology? Yeah, so that's a great question. So in terms of number of electrodes, I'm gonna answer your last question first. We actually believe that the numbers of electrodes will remain the same because typically when you talk to neurosurgeons and neurologists, they just want more data. They, they want to keep the coverage that they have today in order for them to understand where they just start and propagate. In terms of data signal resolution, so yes, we have mentioned some of the publication that is also available on our website. It's a white paper, and we also have published in one of the Nature Journal as well. The ability to have this improved signal to noise resolution do a few things. When you're a doctor, you can have a better confidence that the area that you're tapping into or that you want to do the surgery on is actually the right one. That's the number one thing. And that's exactly the problem they couldn't solve with my friend, Nicole. The second thing is, when you're a patient and when you're in this hospital, in the epilepsy monitoring unit, you are sleep deprived, medication is removed, and really everything is trying to, to actually generate seizures in you, right? If the data are not good enough, we're gonna keep trying and getting the seizures and more seizures and more seizures until we get the result that we need. If you can come to a diagnostic much quicker, it also means that the patients will actually be able to be going sent back home earlier. If you can detect these interictal events, that are so important that, that you need to have a, a good signal to know to be able to do that. You can also detect the events between the seizures, which means you can, they get information and you don't need to necessarily have all the seizures before you can come to a conclusion. And the last piece I would like to mention is who is actually spending most of the time looking at those data? Well, it's typically the EEG technicians that are in the hospitals. And those people spend a lot, a lot of time to prepare and format the data and clean the data properly. And I think there's been a lot of mentions about cleaning data for the first steps, right? If you can do that very quickly, you save a lot of the time and you also save a lot of Thank you. So um, I, this is a really interesting presentation. You did a great job. I, I have a few more questions kind of coming off of what Noah said. Um, Two main questions. One is um, my understanding was that the actual um, electrodes themselves, maybe not what they're put in on, are smaller but have um, higher SNR. And uh, if you record from a smaller area, you may get um, better SNR in that area, but um, miss um, data from nearby. Um, and you still have the same number of total electrodes. So the average SEG implantation in a patient records about 6% of the brain. So now are you going to be recording less of the total brain volume, but getting higher resolution in the areas that you do? So what about all of that missed area that's covered and how is that really going to improve our ability to localize seizure onsets? Yeah, such a good question as well. So just to be clear, we actually don't think that the numbers of channel counts, for example, in NG is gonna decrease. 
if anything is going to increase, and we believe that it's all about coverage in epilepsy, right? So you want to have as much coverage as possible. Now, however, what we have seen, especially in the large animal study that we have done, is that there are tons of tiny signals that you typically don't see using the traditional electrode that you use today. Mm. And so being able to capture those tiny signals before you get like the full activity tells you a lot of information. You know, many people believe that, you know, people who have like the seizures that you can see, they typically have a lot of maybe sometimes in some situation, hundreds of micro seizures in their head. Those micro seizures, if I may name it that way, this is exactly what we can detect. And if you can detect them before the full burnout, then you have a chance to better localize. But again, it's really, you know, fitting into this existing surgical process. And if anything down the line, I think we want more coverage, but it's always at the cost of how many electrodes can you put inside the brain? Yeah, I hope it's answered your question. Just one follow-up question. So um, there is a lot of hype about expanding to a broader band EEG, so going up to like 10,000 um, uh, hertz or kilohertz or 10 kilohertz, um, and that would help localize and looking at HFOs in the literature. And that really hasn't come into uh, clinical practice. So how is this going to translate? You nailed it. So I think personally <laughs> that we don't need to go that high in terms of high frequency. Like, I think the field has a massive challenge first to try and understand what is a pathological from a healthy HFOs, for example. And a lot of the signals that we detect, you know, up to even, even I will say like 500 Hertz, there's a lot of work that we need to do there to understand what we're actually recording from. To be able to properly analyze the signals, you know, you don't need to go more than typically, if you follow like the Nyquist diagram in engineering, you know, a, a thousand Hertz. I always recommend to go to two to three kilohertz just to make sure. But I don't think we need system that do 10 kilohertz. I think it's really about cutting the noise down so we can better understand what those biomarkers are telling us first. And then sure, let's look at something else. But we have some massive work to do uh, on, the, on the lower bands first. All right, uh, I'm gonna put out the offer for one uh, audience question. If anybody has a question for Pierre, last call. Okay. Thank you, Pierre, for your presentation. Thank you very much.